Um, do I have a, oh, this is amazing. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Marius, so I'm uh, the co-founder and CTO of Reinfer. We're working on um, language models that have a much better understanding of natural language than it was possible even a few years ago. <laughs> we're originally a spin-out out of University College London, and the plan is to essentially release these algorithms as a platform that makes it really easy for developers to build conversational interfaces. So for me, a great motivating example are, um, that's it. Um, amazing. Yeah, for me, a great motivating example of why text interfaces matter are Linux terminals. I mean, I started using a terminal back in high school, well, maybe I was 15, and as I got more proficient at using it, I'd reach for the mouse less and less, and it was really a joy just to be able to use the terminal. And the, the main problem is one of vis visual real estate. If you use a graphical user interface, there's only that much space on the screen. Whereas in a terminal, I mean, you can type anything. It's essentially, you can access thousands of commands just by typing a few letters and combine them in very exquisitely complex ways. But I mean, obviously they're not user friendly and there's no wonder that they're not more popular outside the developer community. But everyone, everyone speaks a human language and human languages are a lot more flexible and compositional than any other artificial language we, we ever dreamed of. And you know, you wonder why can't, if, if the intent, if I've got an intention to do something, why isn't it enough just to say it? I like to think of user interfaces, organize them by essentially the cognitive distance between an intent and the end action. Just to be objective, I didn't choose the best representation of the interfaces. That's a, that's a Xerox uh, graphical interface from the 80s. And that's essentially as, maybe as far away as you can get be, between the end goal, let's say I wanna book some tickets for a play. And the, so that would be the intent. And then the end goal is I actually book the tickets for the play. A graphical user interface forces you to break down this into a series of algorithmic steps. Like the first one is, well, go on the website, find the play, choose a time, uh, set, check out, enter your credit card details, and so on. Whereas a language interface, again, not the best representative example of a language interface, a language interface should allow you just to express the intent and the intent contains all of the necessary information by itself to essentially reproduce this series of algorithmic steps that map to a, to a state in the machine. And obviously, I mean, a few decades away, hope we're gonna have brain-computer interfaces where thoughts are enough as, as input to the interface. Um, so we obviously wanted this for a long time. It's, it's nothing new. This is Shirtloo. It's a program developed at MIT um, at the end of the 60s. It, essentially, it was an AI agent that manipulated <laughs> blocks in a virtual world the world was extremely simple. There were just a few spheres, block cones, and you could tell it to move them around, place them on top of each other, and then query the state of the world. The program didn't consist more of just a language parser and a physical simulation of the world. But because the world was so simple, you could essentially describe it with less than 100 words, it did very well. It was, uh, it was an illusion at the end of the day, but as long as you limited yourself to the world, it was very hard to, it felt like it actually understood what you meant. Obviously, today we're much, the landscape's completely different. We have a lot of language interfaces as uh, personal assistants aimed at the consumer market, obviously, Apple, Siri, Google Now, uh, it's uh, Android Assistant, uh, Cortana, Microsoft Cortana. Uh, more excitingly, I mean, Facebook recently announced Facebook M, which is a concierge service. Uh, it's a text service, that they're gonna integrate it with their messaging um, application. And uh, why text is uh, maybe a bit more exciting than speech is that it allows you to seamlessly mix human agents and AI agents and provide a much better user experience. And also, this allows you to essentially learn uh, much quicker because humans just provide training examples for the difficult uh, cases. So maybe your deep neural net won't know how to answer a particular question, it's fine, well, a human's gonna answer it and then you can learn for next time. Obviously, there's some um, developer tools out there. There's API, which is set up by the guys that make Android, uh, the assistant for Android. Uh, the, the one with the lady logo. There's also Wit AI. They're a developer-oriented developer API. So they're actually acquired by Facebook earlier this year. Uh, IBM Watson, which is what I find actually the most exciting over there because they're aimed at businesses and I think this will prove to be more transformational for businesses rather than how you interact with your phone. What's really important and I guess, so some of them are obviously speech interfaces, some are text interfaces. Um, all speech, all practical speech systems are built from a component that first takes speech and maps it to text and then a reasoning component which needs to figure out what the high level intent of the user are, is, what the context is, and then extract relevant entities. 
You want to be able to extract things like location, dates, uh, brands, and so on. I mean, as we heard from Clarify, and I know, I'm sure all of you know that we've seen tremendous progress in understanding speech in the last few years. So things like Google switched to using LSTMs in 2012. That's a, essentially a recurrent type of neural network. However, the reasoning component, which is really the hard part of the problem, it's still, it's still not doing that great. So even if we can transcribe speech with very few errors, it's hard to understand what the intent of the user is. It's very hard to put things in context. And uh, I think what I'm going to try to convince you is that we're, we're in the midst of um, a step change in the performance of the reasoning component. And it's mostly due to learning representations. And I like to think, I mean, deep learning at the end is just about learning good hierarchical representations. It allows, traditionally, if you have a shallow uh, classifier or a shallow uh, regressor, you have to manually engineer good features to get good performance. What's amazing about deep learning is that essentially allows you to just put the raw input data and then the network's gonna learn the right representation from a lot of data. So I'm sure you all seen this picture of, uh, it's for a few years old now, uh, it's a um, neural net, a convolutional neural net published by Google that learned a cat filter unsupervisedly. So there's no supervision, you just looked at YouTube still frames for a long time and you learned to recognize things like faces and cats. And I think we know, we already know that machine vision and speech recognition have seen this tremendous progress and I think language understanding is, is next. And to talk a bit more about representations, um, I'm going to talk about neural language models, which have been around for maybe 12 years now. They were introduced by Yoshi Abenjo in 2003. Um, the idea is that you can learn a vector of real numbers for every word. And the network learns to map every word to a vector of real numbers, such that similar words that appear in similar contexts have similar representations. So you'd expect something like lawyer and courthouse to be close together in this space. So in this diagram, they'd be embedded in a three-dimensional space. Whereas dragon, which doesn't really appear in the same context as lawyer, will end up being further apart. So this, this proved tremendously successful as well. Um, they're essentially all state-of-the-art NLP methods use word embeddings today as the raw input instead of words. And uh, recently, we thought, well, why, why can't we extend this and try to learn essentially an embedding for a whole sentence? Uh, maybe we've got a problem where we care about the spatial relation between two objects. So the cat sat on the mat and the mat sat on the cat should be very different because the relative spatial uh, relation between cat and mat is, is very different. Whereas on the rug, a kitten slept, it's like the cat is still on top of the, the mat, so it should end up being close to the cat sat on the mat. <coughs> this is obviously domain specific and it's a very active area of research. I mean, we recently saw out of uh, Google, um, they, in June, they published Deep Thoughts, which is essentially an LSTM model for learning very good unsupervised representation of sentences. This is also at the very core of our platform. We have do it ourselves with a deep convolutional neural net. We found that compared to recurrent neural nets, they're a lot, trainer to fast, they're a lot faster to train. And also, uh, actually, in the last month, we managed to beat um, the state-of-the-art performance on the SEMEVAL 2014 task, which is a sentence similarity task. So given two sentences, you need to figure out how similar they are. Uh, so the best published results before this are um, Richard Socher. They, they use a three-structure LSTM. Again, we found that the training speed of a deep convolutional net is a fraction of that of a recurrent net. And the performance is, uh, as I said, best. This is useful for us because when we have a, an utterance from a, the user as the input, we need to find essentially what's the most similar, what's the most similar intent that we, the user defined before. And, um, all, once, once we map the sentences to a space, this is a very simple operation. It's either a linear model or just essentially evaluating a dot product. So what we can do, you can cache, you can cache a very large data sets of sentences, and then at inference time, this is a cheap operation. You can essentially index it and do it in milliseconds. But even if, even if you get really good at this and you can essentially identify the high-level intent of the user, that's not enough to build a conversational interface. You obviously, as I said, you need to extract useful things. If, for instance, I say, you know, what's the most affordable flight to Paris for the last weekend of the month? Maybe the user of our platform will already define the intent for the cheapest flights. And it's enough to define that with just a few examples. So very often one example is enough because this neural net is pre-trained on like a ridiculously large amount of data. But in addition to it, we have to extract entities to make it useful. So here, the last weekend of the month, that's, that's a time interval, so we should extract that. Paris is obviously a location, we care about it. And the way we do it, we essentially, we ended up using the 
same base network and just stuck on top of it a network that does name that entity recognition and classifies like the words whether or not they belong to a date, for instance, and use a formal grammar to extract the dates. So it works pretty well. We're planning to release this for free for developers in maybe the next month, where it's planning to be 1st of October, but it'll probably be a bit later on. And we're very interested to see how the community is going to use it. We ourselves are very interested in business applications, in particular business bots that somehow can integrate all of the disparate sources of data that the company has in the cloud today. So you, you, may, you may have your CRM system, you may have uh, whatever GitHub, maybe you're a developer and you, you may have obviously the wikis on GitHub, um, and maybe you use Slack to talk to each other. And for us, it would be amazingly useful if there could be one point, just one point to go where you have access to all of this data and you can query it in a natural way. So maybe go to Slack, there's a Slack button, and you say, you know, what, what were the sales figures for the last June 2015? And this should be able to go to your database, figure out what you meant, essentially aggregate it and present it to you in a nice form in Slack. So this is something we've been working really hard on. And we're also, I mean, uh, we're working with um, a partner, Big Bang, to develop a very custom specific application for customer support, essentially um, answering questions about people's accounts. And thank you very much. <laughs>